The Black Panthers, also known as the Black Panther Party, was a political organization founded in 1966 by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale to challenge police brutality in the African American community. The Black Panthers eventually developed into a Marxist revolutionary group that called for the arming of all African Americans, the exemption of African Americans from the draft, the release of all African Americans from jail, and payment of compensation to African African Americans for centuries of exploitation by white America. At their peak in the late 1960s, Black Panthers membership exceeded 2,000 members and the organization had chapters in several major American cities. Welcome, this is One Mike. I am your host, Country Boy, and as you might have guessed, our episode today is about the legendary Black Panther Party. As always, if you like this, please consider donating to our Patreon page. You'll find that down below in the description. I would also like to give a shout out to our newest Patreon member, Teresa Ludi. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. And if you like more episodes like this, you can find us at onemichistory.com. And please give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. But without further ado, let's get started. On February 17th, 1942, in Monroe, Louisiana, Huey P. Newton was born, the youngest of seven children born to Walter and Amelia Newton. Walter Newton was a paragon of responsibilities. He held down two jobs at any given time, working at the gravel pit, the carbon plant, the sugar cane mills, sawmills, and eventually as a brakeman for the Union Sawmill Company. Amelia Johnson was like many women at the time. She married young and had kids very young. She was only 17 when she had given birth to her first child, and of course, soon others followed but unlike most black women in the south in the 1930s and early 40s Amelia stayed home to raise her young children the Newtons would move to Oakland in 1945 and the Newtons followed a path of many black families migrating from the south to cities in the north and west to fill jobs. During World War II, tens of thousands of blacks left the southern states during the Second Great Migration, moving to Oakland and other cities in the Bay Area to find work in war industries such as the Kaiser Shipyard. The sweeping immigration transformed the Bay Area as well as the cities throughout the West and the North, altering the once white dominated demographic. When the war ended though, many of the blacks were laid off as wartime industries waned and soldiers returned home, creating a labor surplus. Both new and expanding black communities in those cities across the country sank into poverty and a new generation of young blacks grew up in these cities facing a new forms of poverty and racism that was unfamiliar to their parents and they had fought to develop new forms of politics to address these issues. In 1959, Huey P. Newton enrolled in Merrimack College. In 1962, at a rally at Merrimack College that opposed the U.S. blockade against Cuba, Newton's political life would take a huge leap forward where he would meet fellow student Bobby Seale, whom they would eventually form the Black Panther Party. More than five years older than Newton, Bobby Seale was born in Dallas, Texas in October 2nd, 1936. The oldest of three siblings, he was raised in Oakland and his father worked as a carpenter and his mother worked sometimes as a caterer. Besides teaching Bobby how to build things and hunt and fish, Bobby's father also taught him about injustice and would often beat him for no apparent reason. The arbitrary beatings filled Bobby with rage, which he had few outlets, but it also meant that he had very little fear of getting into fights because he had already seen the worst that the world could give. Bobby Seale would join the U.S. Air Force where he would further develop his skills in metalworking and master the use of firearms. He learned to contain and manage his rage, turning his explosive temper into a cold calculation. When three soldiers refused to pay back a debt and threatened to beat Bobby if he mentioned the matter again, he suppressed the instinct to fight them and bought his time. A week later, Bobby attacked the main perpetrator when his defenses were down, nearly killing him with a pipe. Newton and Bobby both had their first 
political experience with Donald Warren of the Afro-American Association. Warren founded an all-black study group while he was a student at Bolt Law School at the University of California, Berkeley. Warren created a space for in-depth discussion of books by black authors such as W.E.B. Du Bois, Ralph Ellison, Booker T. Washington, and James Baldwin. Warren asserted a black nationalist perspective inspired by Malcolm X, emphasizing racial pride and embracing the transcontinental identity rooted in Africa. Warren believed that the virtues of black capitalism and argued that black people must develop our own planned business where efficiency, thrift, and sacrifice was stressed. The Afro-American Association produced a radio show that debated the concerns of Black America, regularly mobilizing street corner rallies, preaching racial consciousness to unemployed Blacks, and sponsored conferences entitled The Mind of the Ghetto. Through all of this, Newton was a man of action, and he grew dissatisfied with Warren's teaching. Newton felt that Warren was heavy on talk, but ultimately could not be counted on. In Newton's view, Warren offered a community solution that offered nothing, and he doubted much could be accomplished through black capitalism. Soon, he split for Warren in search of his own path. In August 1965, six months after Malcolm X had died, the Watts neighborhood in Los Angeles exploded in one of the largest urban riots in United States history. Black migrants had begun moving to Watts in the 1920, creating a black island in a sea of white towns such as White Gates, Linwood, Compton, and Bell. Home lending regulations excluded blacks from obtaining mortgages to buy houses in white neighborhoods, and by 1945, Watts was 80% black. Throughout the 50s, the black migration continued, and more and more blacks migrated to California than any other state. During this decade, the black population of New York increased by two and a half times, Detroit tripled, while the blacks in LA grew eightfold. Meanwhile, the white residents fleed in droves to the suburbs, taking employment opportunities with them. The tensions between the Watts residents and the police ran high. While the vast majority of the Watts residents in 1965 were blacks, only 4% of the police in the Los Angeles the Police Department and 6% of Los Angeles County Sheriff Department was black. The police chief, William Parker, used and analyzed crime data to develop and justify the policing of explicit targeted areas in Watts and other black neighborhoods for heavy police coverage, including intensive techniques such as routine frisking of people on the street. Officers would use force with their nightsticks, which they called nigger knockers, and the local NAACP would report that Negroes in Los Angeles never knew where or what hour the blows would come from, from the guardians of the law that was supposed to be protecting them. The incident that sparked the Watts riots was a traffic stop. 22-year-old Marquette Fry was driving a 1955 Buick along 116th Street near his family's house at 6 p.m. on August 11, 1965, when he was pulled over by the California Highway Patrol. His younger brother, Ronald Fry, was the only passenger. A crowd had gathered, including Marquette's mother, Rena, and more police soon arrived. Soon the crowd was over two hundred people and onlookers became agitated as the police reportedly slapped Raina Fry Marquette's mother and beat her with a blackjack, twisting her arm behind her back. And with that, Watts exploded. On August the 12th, a group identified as followers of Malcolm X arrived on Avalon Boulevard shouting, let's burn, baby, burn. And the next day, the emergency control center recorded that six Negro males were firing at helicopters from a vehicle. By this end of the second day, according to Los Angeles Times, several hundred thousand people were looting stores, stealing guns, machetes, and other weapons. Rebels were filling glass bottles with gasoline and hurling Molotov cocktails in the cars and stores, setting them on fire. Many also fired shots at the police and fire trucks and ambulance that attempted to enter this area were also attacked. 
By the time the rebellion was over, it had spread almost 50 miles and all told 34 people had been killed, almost all of them black, many by the police, more than 1,000 were wounded and 4,000 people were arrested. The riot caused more than $40 million in damage and over 200 buildings were completely destroyed. The residents of Watts were filled with rage because of the poor conditions, chafed by police repression, frustrated by civil rights politics that were unable to redress the situation. The residents of Watts would take the matter into their own hands, forcibly rejecting the old guard of civil rights leadership and following the rebellion, Martin Luther King would would go to Watts to bring his vision of integrated society and his tactics of nonviolence. On August 8th, he spoke at 500 people in Westminster Neighborhood Association, and throughout the evening, the audience repeatedly challenged and ridiculed Dr. King's appeal. And nonviolent activist Dick Gregory fared even worse worse than Watts. While the riot was going on, he borrowed a bullhorn from the police so that he could speak to the rioters and he attempted to calm them and pleaded for them to go home. And a gunman in the crowd would shoot Gregory in the leg. The politics of nonviolence were failing, committing commencing a wave of urban rebellion and rejection of civil rights strategies by disenchanted blacks. Between 1962 and 1965, the Los Angeles Police Department killed at least 65 people. Of the 65 homicides by police that the police coroner investigated, 64 were rules justifiable, including 27 cases in which the victim was shot in the back by police officers, 25 in which the victim was unarmed, 23 in which the victim has been suspected of a nonviolent offense, and 4 in which the victim not suspected of a crime at all. The only case in which the coroner's inquest ruled that unjustifiable homicide was when two officers playing cops and robbers on Long Beach Station shot a news reporter. Meanwhile, Huey Newton would re reconnect with Bobby Seale and the two joined the Soul Students Advisory Council founded by Ernie Allen. The council was a front group for the Revolutionary Action Movement, an anti-imperialistic Marxist black nationalist organization founded in Philadelphia. Allen had collaborated with Newton and Seale on the Afro-American Association when he was a student at Merriman College. Working with Ram exposed Newton and Seal to new ideas, both of which were strongly influenced by the thinking of Malcolm X and readings from the Afro-American Association. But unlike the Afro-American Association, Ram was a revolutionary black nationalist organization with a strong socialist intent and anti-imperialistic mindset. The politics of RAM connected the struggles of black Americans to the liberation struggles abroad, whereas black soldiers returning from World War II helped jumpstart the civil rights movement by arguing that if they could die fighting for their country, then they should be considered full citizens upon their return. RAM insisted that blacks were not full citizens of the United States. RAM viewed America as an independent nation and that it had been colonized at home because black Americans were colonial subjects rather than citizens. Citizens, Ram argued that they had no allegiance to the United States government and thus should not fight in the Vietnam War. The Revolutionary Action Movement advanced the pivotal idea which becomes central to the politics of the Black Panther Party. The Revolutionary Action Movement led the way for developing a Black nationalist thought, but the group's practical application of these ideas was very limited. They rarely emphasized practical action, and when they did, it was oriented around students. Huey Newton became dissatisfied with the group's inability to appeal to the brothers on the block. Newton and Seal wanted to challenge police brutality directly. They wanted to mobilize the ghetto in a way that the civil rights movement had mobilized the blacks in the South, and they dreamt of an unstoppable force that would transform the urban landscape forever. The problem was now clear, but Newton and Seal didn't yet have a solution. 
But that was all about the change following the September 27th, 1966 murder of Matthew Johnson. The UC Berkeley chapter of Students for the Democratic Societies decided to hold a conference on black power and invited Stokely Carmichael, the SNCC chairman and leading opponent of black power to be their keynote speaker. The conference featured a symbol of a black panther from the Lodez County Freedom Organization that Carmichael was publicizing. The L. CFO was part of a new effort by local blacks and the SNCC to build an independent political party outside of exclusive white Democratic Party, marking a departure from its strategy of mobilizing civil disobedience against Jim Crow segregation in the early 60s. In 1966, Carmichael would write that organizing under the Black Panther symbol across the country because a man needs a panther by his side. His family wants to endure as hundreds of Alabama have endured loss of jobs, evictions, starvation, sometimes death for political activity. Huey Newton was one of those that took notice of the bold logo and courageous organizations. Writing several years later, Newton recalled that I had read the pamphlet about the voter registration in Alabama and how people in the Lodez County were arming themselves against establishment's violence. The political group called the Lodez County Freedom Organization had a Black Panther for a symbol, and a few days later, Bobby and I were rapping, and I suggested that we use the Black Panther for our symbol. Newton and Seal decided to form a chapter of the Black Panther Party, originally called the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. The Black Panther Party was dissatisfied with the failure of these organizations to directly challenge police brutality and appeal to brothers on the block. So Huey Newton and Bobby Seale would turn matters into their own hands. After the murder of Matthew Johnson, Newton observed the violent insurrection that followed and he had an epiphany that would distinguish the Black Panther Party from a multitude of other black power organizations. Newton had an explosive rebellious anger of the ghetto and a social force that believed that he could stand up to the police. He believed that he could organize a force of political power and inspired by Robert F. Williams' armed resistance against the Ku Klux Klan and Williams' book called Negroes with Guns, Newton studied the gun laws extensively extensively in California, and he decided to organize patrols that will follow the police around and a monitor for incidents of brutality with one crucial difference. The patrols would carry loaded weapons. Seal would later state that we'll protect a mother, protect a brother, and protect the community from racist cops. On one night in particular, in early 1967, Huey Newton, Bobby Seal, and Bobby Hutton, their first recruit, put these ideas into action. They cruised around North Oakland in a 1954 Chevy, Newton at the wheel, and saw police patrolling the area and decided to monitor it. As Bobby Seale would later talk about the incident, Newton sped up within a short residential block behind the car and kept his distance. When the officer turned right, Newton turned right. When the officer turned left, Newton turned left. Newton was armed with a shotgun, Seal with the 45, and Hutton with the M1 rifle. The law book sat in the back seat. After they followed the car for a while, the officer pulled up onto the curb and stopped on the corner. And there was a stop sign at the corner, so Newton pulled up to the intersection and stopped next to the police officer. And the three men looked over to the officer and Seal held shotgun while he drove. Both the shotgun and the M1 rifle were plainly visible through the window and the officer looked back and after a pause Newton gently stepped on the gas and rounded the corner to go right in front of the officer. As Newton completed the turn, the officer flashed on his high beams and Newton kept driving. The officer stepped on the gas and pulled after him and still could see the flashing red lights, but Newton kept going. He said that I'm not gonna stop until he puts on his damn siren because a red flashing light don't mean nothing to me. At this point, the car was headed north on Dover Street behind Merriman College. Newton to the left on 58th Street and headed down the block passing the Merriman College track field and the officer turned on the siren. So Newton pulled over, coming to a stop at the back door of the college. As soon as Newton pulled over, the officer stopped and burst out of his car hollering, what you goddamn niggas doing with all them guns? Who the hell do you niggas think you are? Get out of the goddamn car. 
And at this point, students had just finished the evening class of the predominantly black school and they had filed out the back. Then they stopped to watch. Many of the residents came out of their homes or were looking out of their windows. The officer approached the car, screaming, get out of the car. Newton refused. And at this point, the officer pulled open the door and shouted, get out of the goddamn car and bring those guns out where with you. The officer stuck his head in the car and reached across Newton and tried to grab the barrel of the shotgun that Seal was holding. Seal pulled back the shotgun. Newton grabbed the officer and they tussled and he kicked him out of the car. Newton took the shotgun from Seal, leaped out of the car, and then proceeded to chamber around. And he shouted, Newton shouted, who the hell do you think you are? The officer lifted his hands away from his gun while Bobby Seal and Hutton jumped out of the car. Seal pulled back the hammer on his 45 and the officer backed away from Newton towards his car and radioed for backup. People were streaming out of their houses right now and more students streamed out of the college. Newton and Seal beckoned people to come out and observe the police and a sizable crowd had formed. Seal called out to the crowd that the police were attempting to occupy their community as foreign troops occupied territory and the black people were tired of it as several more police cops arrived. The officers walked up to Newton and demanded to let them see their weapons. Newton asked if he was being placed under arrest and the officer insisted that he needed to see his weapon and Newton refused. You can't see my gun and you can't have my gun. Another officer walked up to Seal and shouted to come over to the car and he stated, I ain't going to goddamn place. Newton, Seal, and Hutton would not submit to the police, citing local ordinances as well as the Second Amendment of the Constitution and were asserting their rights to bear arms as long as the guns were not concealed. The standoff threatened to escalate, but after tense deliberations, the police lieutenant told the officers that he did not see sufficient grounds for an arrest and after looking around, one of the officers noticed that the license plate on Bobby Seal's Chevy was attached by a coat hanger. So he then wrote Seal a ticket for not having his license plate correctly fastened to his vehicle and the police left. The excited crowd gathered around Newton to hear what would just happen and the men described their organization, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. And the next day, several community members who had witnessed the event had joined the Black Panther Party. Bobby Seal provided the first guns, the Black Panther Party, from his personal collection, a 30-30 Winchester rifle and a shotgun from his time in the military. He still had been around guns, mostly hunting with his father. When new recruits joined the party, obtaining more firearms became a priority. Newton and Seal approached Richard Okoye, which was a Japanese-American radical who had an impressive gun collection and was a dedicated revolutionary committed to third world liberation. He was pleased to help the Black Panther Party get started and donated two guns of his own to support the revolutionary cause, an M1 rifle and a 9mm pistol. Newton and Seal needed to raise money for more guns for their party, so Newton had the idea of selling Mao Zedong's Little Red Book on the Berkeley campus to raise money. The book was a collection of quotations from the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party who had been receiving a lot of press coverage. They went down to Chinatown in San Francisco and bought the book for 30 cents and sold them for a dollar on Berkeley's campus. Soon they raised enough money to buy a 357 Magnum from Okoye and a standard shotgun from the local department store. Over the course of several months of patrolling the police, Newton and Seal had gained a small following and Bobby got Newton a job at the Poverty Youth Program where he worked. The two used a portion of their paycheck to pay for the rent for the Black Panther Party's office in Northern Oakland near Merriman College. In early 1967, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense had only a handful of members. The organization had received almost no coverage in the press and was only known by those whom the Black Panther Party had direct contact with or through word of mouth. But by February, that was all about to change. In 1967, the Contra Costa Sheriff Department reported that a deputy sheriff, Mel Burkhurst, and Keith Gibson had arrived at the scene of a burglary in progress and claimed that when they arrived, Denzel Dow and another man had ran from the back of a liquor store and refused to stop when ordered to halt. Bunkhorse fired one blast from a shotgun, striking Denzel and killing him, and the other man would escape. 
for the Dowels, the official statement didn't add up. Community members helped investigate. The Dowels knew Bunkhurst. He had issued several citations to Denzel in the past, and on one occasion, it threatened to kill Denzel. The more they probed, the more contradictory the facts appeared, and there was no sign of entry, forced or otherwise, into the liquor store. Further, the police had reported that Denzel had not only run, but had jumped two fences to get away before being shot down. But Denzel had a bad hip and a limp, and the family said that he could not run, let alone jump a fence. And when the coroner's report was released, the community's skepticism only grew. The report stated that Dow bled to death, yet there had been a no pool of blood near Denzel when he was found. There was, however, a pool of blood 20 yards away from the site where the police claimed that Denzel had died. The report listed six bullet holes, apparently confirming the neighbor's report of hearing multiple shots. The next day, the Black Panther Party began their own investigation into the killing of Denzel Dow. Bobby Seale and Huey Newton and a few members from the party started to spend time in North Richmond talking to George Dow and the younger generation on the street and sitting with Miss Dow in her home. They spoke to neighborhoods and other community members and sought out witnesses and talked to the coroner's office and spoke to the forensics experts and they decided they were gonna do whatever it took to get justice for Denzel Dow. The family spoke to the sheriff, Walter Young, and he was cordial and polite, but remained unyielding. They maintained that Denzel was committing an act of felony when Burkhor shot him. The killing was justified and claimed that he was in the best interest of North Northern Richmond's community at heart. Young insisted that he would neither suspend Burkhorst nor modify the police department's policy to shoot or when to not shoot suspects. The Dows held out hope local political officials would eventually help them achieve justice. But when meeting with those officials, it left no doubt that they would need to find another approach. Seal and Newton quickly organized a street corner rally to talk with community members about the Denzel Dow's case and explain their program. especially their position on self-defense. They organized a street corner rallies in the past in Oakland and San Francisco and in sight of armed uniformed Black Panthers had always caught people's attention and often got them to listen to the Panthers' political program. Newton and Seal planned a rally on 3rd and Chester in Richmond for April 22nd at 5 p.m. 15 Panthers showed up in uniform, most of them armed and gathered on the street corner. In this way, it effectively claimed the corner and unofficially declared that this was a Panther zone. A small crowd would start to gather and Seal started talking about the Dowell case. The Panthers always attracted attention when they organized street discussion, but this response was on a different level. If the Denzel Dow could be killed by the police with impunity, so could any other young man in his neighborhood, and the crowd soon swelled while the police scared many in this community. He was a group of young men organized and disciplined, openly displaying weapons, speaking their mind, calls stopped, and traffic backed up, and soon over 150 people had gathered. The rally was tremendous, and community members searched for ways of doing more about the Denzel Dow killing and showed them a way that they could mobilize the black community and they could take issues into their own hands. Newton and Seal had captured the community's imagination and others began chipping into the organization to help whip subsequent rallies. Eldridge Cleaver had been impressed with Newton during confrontations with the police and helped Newton and Seal publicize rallies. In this process, he created the party's first newspaper. Emory Douglas, a student at San Francisco College, contributed graphic arts expertise. The paper immediately became a party tool running over a decade into international distribution and at its height, it had a circulation in hundreds of thousands. As awareness of the Black Panther Party grew, on May 2nd, 1967, the California State Assembly Committee on the Criminal Procedure was scheduled to convene to discuss what was known as the Mumford Act, which would make public carry of a loaded weapon illegal. Newton and his Minister of Information, Eldridge Cleaver, put together a plan to send 26 armed Black Panthers led by Bobby Seal from Oakland to Sacramento to protest the bill. 
on the morning of May 2nd, 30 Black Panthers put on uniforms and picked up their guns and headed to Sacramento. Bobby Seale led a delegation of 24 men and six women, and Eldridge Cleaver also went to Sacramento that day, but was not part of the delegation. He was part of the Ramparts Magazine, an American political magazine that had assigned him to cover Black Panther action with the understanding that he would not take part. Consistent with Oakland's patrol, the Black Panther planned to remain firmly within the laws of restricting gun use and they would take care, for example, to keep their guns aimed only up or down and not to point them at anyone so that their actions could not be construed as displaying their weapon in a threatening manner. Newton also instructed the group to not shoot unless fired upon and when the Panthers arrived at the Capitol building in Sacramento, they got out of their cars heavily armed and Bobby Seale asked the bystanders where they could find the assembly chambers. Right away, several TV cameras took notice and ran up to the delegation and began filming. By the time the delegations arrived at the California State Assembly Chambers on the second floor, a swarm of reporters had gathered around them, taking pictures and asking questions. The assembly sessions were open to the public, but the public was not allowed on the assembly floor. So when the Panthers reached the floor to the assembly, one of the reporters barged into the assembly to get a better pick of the Panthers as they entered. Seal and about 12 Black Panthers followed, and according to the San Francisco Chronicle, the assembled speaker pro temp Carlos B who was facing the door saw the gathering of news and television cameras and what seemed like a stampede angrily shouted to the sergeant at arms Tony Beard to remove the intruding reporters one of the guards said to the Black Panthers that you're not supposed to be here and that is not where you're supposed to be while trying to decide whether to stay on the assembly floor or to go back upstairs the officer came up behind Bobby Hutton and grabbed the gun out of his hand. Bobby started to shout at the officer and chased him out to get his gun back. The Black Panthers followed him into the hallway and Assemblyman Mumford wasted absolutely no time lobbying for his legislation. He quickly rose to inform his colleagues that the reporters were not the only ones trying to get onto the Assembly floor. A serious situation had just occurred, he explained, and that people with weapons forced their way onto the chamber and were ejected. When the Panthers entered the hallway, the state police surrounded them and grabbed and took their weapons. Seal demanded his weapons back and a chance to publicly read the party statement. And as the police pushed the Panthers into the elevator down the stairs, the police reviewed the situation and decided the Panthers had broken no laws and returned their guns. Having now captured the attention of reporters, Seal read the Panthers statement in front of the press, which much of California and the country watching. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense calls for the American people in general and black people in particular to take careful note of the racist character of California legislature, which is now considering legislation aimed to keep black people disarmed, powerless. At the very same time, the racist police agencies throughout the countries intensify the terror, brutality and murder and repression of black people. The enslavement of black people in the very beginning of this country, genocide practice on American Indians and confined to survivors of reservations and the savage lynching towards black men and women and the dropping of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the cowardly massacre of the Vietnamese all intensify the fact that towards people of color and the racist power struggle in America has but one policy, repression, genocide, terror, and the big stick. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense believes that it's time for black people to arm themselves against this terror before it's too late. The pending Mumford Act begins an hour of doom one step nearer. A people who have suffered so much for so long at the hands of a racist society, we must draw the line somewhere. We believe that black communities in America must rise up as one man must halt progression of a trend that lends inevitably to the total destruction. With their guns in tow, Seal read his statement several more times and the members of the Black Panther Party delegation walked down the Capitol steps across the lawn to their cars shortly after the Panther got in their cars and headed towards Oakland. A contingent of police with riot guns and pistols appeared on their tail accompanied by reporters. 
After leaving, the Panthers pulled into a service station and police surrounded them. Came up behind Black Panther Sherman Forte and grabbed his hands, forcing him behind his back. When Seal asked if Forte was under arrest, officers answered that he was, and Seal told Forte to make the arrest. With the cameraman capturing the Seal for national TV, the police searched and arrested the remainder of the group in what appeared to be a makeshift arrest. Seal was originally arrested for carrying a concealed weapon, even though he had openly displayed his pistol on his hip, and television coverage caught the officers looking for illegal weapons and comparing the length of the Panther shotguns to their own. To one officer charge, one Black Panther would explain that that ain't no sawed off. That's the same riot gun that looked just like yours. The police officers booked several of the Panthers on obscure fish and game codes that prohibited loaded guns and vehicles. And all 19 young adults and five juveniles were arrested. But included in this group was also Eldridge Cleaver, who was there covering the event, carrying only a camera. Although it was perfectly legal for the Panthers to enter the state capitol bearing arms, a fact that the state police would acknowledge at the time, at the police station, officials are charged the Panthers with conspiracy to invade assembly chambers, which was a felony. After Sacramento, the Black Panthers faced legal challenges raised from bailing and hiring lawyers. Such challenges have always been important daily work to the early insurgents of the civil rights movement, and they were not unfamiliar to the Black Panthers. But at this point, legal challenges had only a peripheral concern to the Black Panther Party for self-defense, but now it had become a central concern. The Black Panthers' leadership had found themselves in a strange situation after Sacramento. The Black Panther Party was now had a burgeoning membership dedicated to the revolutionary program, but it was built on the strength of the tactic of policing the police. The Black Panthers had thrusted themselves to the center of the movement debate about how to define black power and what black liberation should look like. At the same time, their tactics were key to the effectiveness had been taken from them. How would the Black Panthers be able to mobilize the brothers on the block without a legal option of arming themselves, and how would they be able to pay for their mounting legal costs, such as bail payments and lawyer fees stemming from the Sacramento incident. Thank you. This has been One Mike, and this was part one of the Black Panther Party. If you like this and enjoy this, please consider donating to our Patreon page. Also, visit us at onemikehistory.com and give us five stars on Apple Podcasts. And peace.